Good afternoon um, and welcome to Diversity Dialogues um, this month where we're celebrating Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And so we'll be talking with um, four of our esteemed faculty here at the School of Dentistry and just learning all about uh, their journeys and their stories, what brought them to academics, also their experiences perhaps that are unique as those who identify as Asian Americans. Um, and so we're gonna jump right in, folks are logging on. And so um, I think it'll be a rich conversation. I'm really excited. I'm also just a, a, a history nerd and well, a nerd in general, right? We're all dentists. Um, but a history buff. So I really like learning about people's narratives and like how they got here and all about their story. And I think it really allows us to get to know people um, on a different level. Um, and it, and it um, gives us a level of empathy. It gives us a, a level of camaraderie um, because we may have things in common that, you know, we don't see on the surface, but that we learn about each other once we learn more about their story. Um, so with that, um, could you guys share with us about your story? Tell us maybe about your upbringing, um, what influence did your parents or whatever your familial unit was um, kind of have on you and your life's decisions? And whoever wants to start, it, it, we can jump off. I'll start. So um, just for those who don't know me, my name is Sampa Pinchard and I'm from Thailand. So, so I grew up I'm actually the first one in the family who actually gone to dental school. My, my heritage is on, on my, my dad's side is, is actually, my dad's half Chinese. My grandfather actually immigrated to Thailand from China and, and he actually made my last name. So I'm only third generation Ben Charit. So, so everybody have the same last name as me is all related in like, you know, trace back three generation, maybe four or five generation now. But, um, but so, so I grew up, in the business kind of family. And I was always want to be a, actually my dream job was want to be a science professor actually. <laughs> and somehow I end up, I end up in dental school. We can, we can go on forever, but I just gonna let other people talk about themselves. So. Thanks so much for that, um, Sampap. And, and, and why, actually it's totally, um, forgive me. Why don't we introduce everyone to start with? Yeah. Um, Dr. Dr. Um, ben Sherrod, um introduce yourself. Tell us what department you're in. Um, maybe just briefly your educational background. I know you have a gazillion things about you. So just the, hi the highlights. Yeah. So um, um, again, my name is Sampa Ben Sherrod and I was in general practice until recently. I now moved to the Philip Institute. Um, I'm running uh, CAD CAM Digital Dentistry for the past four and a half year until recently. Now I'm doing uh, clinical research, which we probably can talk about it another, another time. I went to Thailand for dental school and I did my PROS training at UNC Chapel Hill. And I did my PhD in oral biology. I did a postdoc. I taught there for 11 years and now I'm here. Awesome, thanks for that. How about you, uh, Dr. Chang? Tell us um, your, a little bit of just your dental background, your position here at the school. So I'm in general practice department, associate professor, and uh, I would begin my training. Well, where should I go? Uh, back in India, I graduated from India and with my uh, BDS, came to US, immigrated to Canada, came to US, did my two years of AEGD in New York and then my community dentistry fellowship there as well. Then I came to teach part-time for three months in VCU and then departed to go to University of Florida for my ortho fellowship. And um, then life brought me back before I could begin my ortho residency back to VCU. And I did my, I joined here as a faculty and as part-time I completed my master's in clinical translation sciences. Then I did mini residency in dental sleep medicine. And uh, so I'm, I have my dental degree, I have master's and then I'm a diplomat of uh, American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine. Awesome, thanks so much for that. How about you, Dr. Tran? Yes, yeah, so, um... I'm, uh, my name is Dan Tran. I was actually been in Virginia almost my whole life. I grew up in Northern Virginia, went to Falls Church High School up there, 
Uh, after that, I went to Blacksburg to go to Virginia Tech, go Hokies. Um, mm-hmm. Once I went to Blacksburg, graduated from Virginia Tech, came to VCU for dental school. So for those who don't know, I used to be a dental student here as well. And I have a hard time trying to break this habit. I, I still talk to everyone, uh, my colleagues now, like they're my professors because they all taught me. So um, did that, graduated from there. Uh, and then stayed on for another four years to do my uh, oral and facial surgery residency. Uh, I liked it a lot, had all intentions of going into private practice. And then uh, my mentor now, uh, Dr. Albacher and uh, Dr. Duke convinced me to, uh, to stay on and, uh, and talk to me about it and talk about academics. And so here I am now as a faculty member here at VCU. And so I consider myself a life here at VCU in Virginia and and the public uh, school and uh, institutions. Awesome, thanks so much. And Dr. Rathor? Hi, uh, so my name is Sonali Rathor. Um, I'm originally from India. I did my dental school from a city called Pune, which is very close to Bombay. Uh, for those of you who know uh, Bombay, one of the you know, main cities there. Um, and after my dental school, I moved here um, to do my residency. Um, and I did my residency in oral radiology from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and while I was at UNC Chapel Hill, um, I also uh, actually TA'd part-time at Duke University um, in a completely different department, it was called uh, Asian and African Languages and Literature mm-hmm. Department. Uh, but it was very exciting because I think it really uh, showed me a different perspective um, and uh, really helped me acclimate to the uh, school system here. Um, and once I finished my residency, um, I, you know, applied for a position here at VCU. Uh, this was back in 2010, so I've been here 11 years, believe it or not. Um, so it's been it's been very interesting and uh, very exciting at the same time. Well, thank you guys so much. Even just your introductions, I think it's so awesome. I mean, obviously I'm biased. I'm the diversity guy, right? But I think it's so cool, um, even in your introductions, to hear the diversity of like your your dental evolution, right? Um, I think I knew that Dr. Chang had done an ortho fellowship, but I didn't know the the extent, right? And I think even in Dr. Rathor's experience, like how do you end up TAing um, you know, at Duke when you're, when you're in residency at UNC and in a completely non-science field, right? So I, I think that's really cool. Um, so for, um, I know Dr. Ben already answered this, but with Dr. Chang and Dr. Tran and Dr. Rathor, tell us a little bit about like your family upbringing and maybe how that shaped you, those experiences. I know Dr. Chang talked about, um, you know, immigrating through Canada and different things like that. So just a little bit about maybe that journey. Sure. Um, so I would say um, we moved as a family. I had two young kids, uh, 18 year old and uh, three year old, uh, I have two boys. That's what their ages were at that time. And coming to immigrating to Canada, Toronto, and um, I, we stayed there about uh, just about two years. And that was our first time um, meaning I would say that's where we immigrated. So, you know, don't have driver's license, didn't have a dental license, and suddenly you were nobody, uh, you know, and you're trying to find yourself. You're trying to find uh, uh, a place for your family. You're trying to find your profession. You're trying to uh, have your kids adapt to a new place. I think it was a very, um, it, it was a, it was a very, I want, I don't want to say difficult because when I look back, I think those are the sweetest moments I remember. Um, I don't remember because we're talking about and we will, I don't think I faced from anywhere any discrimination um, of any point, but I saw the richness, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also found a little bit segregation in that mm-hmm. um, we were in North York, which is more in Toronto, and then there's uh, there are different uh, places. Um, um, North York, I remember, then there's something else, you know, so they pretty much, where you go, it's like, you pretty much presumed that you be, you stay in that area where all the Indians stay. Um, I was not staying in that area. It just happened to be we were in North York where generally more, 
Jews are, you know, that's so typically we, so, but I think it was such a good mix, yet it was so segregated, uh, but it, you never felt um, alone or if you're going to uh, shop somewhere, if you're, a, if you have an accent, nobody made uh, kind of looked at you in a strange way to see if they, they were very open to it, that everybody had an accent there. So I think that's one brief um, thing I can share. And then of course we applied to all dental schools and um, I, we got accepted. I applied for some advanced AGD programs and got accepted in Eastman Institute of Oral Health, Rochester, New York. And that's how we entered US. And from there, nearly so many states, Rochester, New York, Richmond, Virginia, and University of Florida, Gainesville. So mm -hmm. I, I did have a, quite a go around from very cold to very hot to in between. <laughs> um, well, the, that was kind of my dental journey that took us, uh, um, you know, all these three states. But what, uh, what brought us from India to US or North America was more of a stability for our kids. Uh, that is what brought us here. Um, my family unit, uh, I have a brother and uh, we have a small, we had always a small family unit. And I would say, uh, even being from India, when I hear, uh, when I hear that, uh, um, you know, women are not given equal chance or something, my parents were always so encouraging. I never felt that I couldn't do something because they would always say, my mother especially, if you're a woman, you can do more, you know? So um, I, I really had a very, uh, very broad uh, view from my parents and grew up to be very independent in my decision-making. Awesome, uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, you know, you brought up, um, I, one of the things that, I, that I've, I've really enjoyed in my role here, I, I started teaching here in 2015, I think, um, and, you know, as I've interacted with um, a lot of our IDP students, our international dental program students, it's always so fascinating to talk to them about their journey. And the, um, and I think there's actually literature out there now about the level of stress that they endure yeah. um, because you're dealing with visa issues and green card issues and just all these different things that while dental school is stressful, certainly for all students, it's, it is a different level of stress that you're dealing with or getting acclimated to a new area or learning a new language or just it being very different. And um, those have always been really rich interactions that I've had with our IDP students and getting to learn and understand things about various segments of Indian culture or, you know, how it parallels something else. So that, that's been really rich, you know, from my perspective. Um, Dan, uh, Dr. Tran, how about your upbringing right, right here in Virginia? Can you tell us a little bit about your family yeah. and how that impacted maybe your decisions in life? Yeah, so I am the first generation born in America. Uh, I'm half Vietnamese, my dad's from Vietnam and I'm half Laotian, uh, my mom's from there. Very rare that you'll see that combination, but it's because they met here in America. Um, my wife is Thai, so our daughter is a little melting pot of Southeast Asia, uh, <laughs> which is what you get when you come to America. Um, no one in my family is actually in healthcare. Uh, my parents actually didn't want me to be in healthcare, uh, particularly like a surgeon because of the lifestyle. Um, and actually, we're trying to talk me out of it. But they were supportive of, of my decision to eventually go into healthcare. Uh, my dad, he was actually a refugee and escaped Vietnam shortly before the war had ended. He spent about a year as a refugee in a refugee camp in one of the islands in the Philippines because they had to find uh, where to keep everyone. And he actually got there with a little canoe boat and a motor and just went from Vietnam to uh, the Philippines. Um, and so it's quite a treacherous journey and he was lucky to have made it there. And I'm not sure if any of you all or, or many people know about how being a refugee worked back then, but how it worked was countries from around the world, they only take a certain number of people and you couldn't choose which country you wanted to go to. And so my dad was actually offered to come to the United States but his sister was offered Germany. And so he refused to go without his sister. And so he waited until the United States had offered refuge for both of them. 
And so like most of the immigrants, he, that come to America, he saw the opportunity that America could provide. And so he came here when he was 17 with nothing but him and his family and the clothes that they were wearing. So he literally came here with nothing. Um, he knew that his future kids would have a better life here and he was right. Uh, there's few places in the world where in one generation you could start with nothing and then with a little bit of hard work and some luck, um, your kids can become a dentist or a surgeon. Um, everything that I've accomplished is because of the sacrifices that he had made and, and the struggles that he had to go through pale in comparison to, uh, or the struggles I had to go through pale in comparison to what he had to go through. Uh, and I'm thankful for what he did and to allow me to have all these great opportunities here in America. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I think it's, it's, it's really rich that you point out the wide, um, again, diversity of variety there is, even just within South Asian culture, right? Like there's so yes. many different um, ethnicities, religions, dialects, languages, like it's just this richness um, that I think often is lost on the average American probably um, and not understanding all that difference. Um, and so that I think you're, you're, you're literally like a physical representation um, of that. So thanks for offering that. How about you, Dr. Rathor? So um, I grew up in India, just like Harmeet. Um, and I'm actually an only child, uh, grew up in a nuclear family with just mom and dad. Uh, my dad was a mechanical engineer and he worked for a really big uh, steel manufacturing company. So um, my earliest memory is that I remember moving from state to state every two years. So he would tell us, um, he would make it exciting and tell us like it's a new adventure, but that would mean leaving you know, all your friends behind, making new ones. Um, and in India, all the states um, are very different. You know, They have different culture, different cuisine, uh, different language. Um, so I think I was exposed to that diverse environment from really early on. Um, and my mom, um, she's a school teacher. She uh, just like a couple years back, she retired. Um, she's been a high school teacher for over 40 years now. Um, and so um, academics and, you know, uh, being in, in the um, teaching uh, field was very um, akin to me. Like I, I was used to seeing that. Uh, I was used to seeing like students come and visit us in the house. Um, so in India, it's very different. You know, sometimes um, to express thanks, people will come to your house, you know, bring flowers, sweets. Um, so I've grown up seeing that. Um, so when I was in dental school, um, I think uh, I was really excited about the prospect of getting into academics. Um, so once I graduated uh, dental school, um, my first job out of dental school was actually in, um, in a dental school. Uh, back in India as well. So I worked for, a, it was like a brand new dental school that was opened in uh, Pune at the time. Um, and I joined there, uh, what was called the outpatient department. We were, there were four of us who were responsible for starting the outpatient department. Um, and we were like this young, um, you know, 23 year old, uh, four girls starting outpatient department. And uh, some people, when they would come in, they wouldn't believe we were dentists. They would think we were just students. Uh, so we were, so that was something to deal with too, like to assure them that, you know, we had graduated dental school and we were ready to practice. Uh, so it was really fun and interesting. And um, when I came here, I think just being, a, being used to being in academics, uh, I mentioned to you, you know, I, I TA'd for the uh, AAL department. It, it just came naturally. I think I wanted to be involved with uh, teaching and learning and um, being close to students. Um, so I think that um, grow, growing up seeing that, it was very natural to uh, morph into that here as well. Um, and then I uh, joined, once I finished the program, I joined um, the dental school here in Virginia, and I've been here ever since. So um, I think what, uh, for me, the journey into academics was very easy. I think I had seen it um, my whole life growing up. Um, you know, I saw uh, for my mom, um, apart from being a you know, wife and a mother, I think uh, the role of being a teacher was very fulfilling to her. Um, and she still tells me that, you know, she still takes these tuitions um, at home sometimes. And she tells me that the fact that she can do something for her students every day keeps her uh, alive and uh, happy. Um, and so uh, I think um, 
you know, I have never looked back, like, you know, about my decision being as a teacher, uh, being able to help students and, um, you know, help the next generation that follows us. Um, it, it just makes for a good experience for myself. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, so Dr. Rathor touched a little bit on sort of like why academics, like how you got into academia. And um, Dr. Tran mentioned it a little bit, but, um, you know, more robustly, maybe um, the rest of you can answer. So, so why academics? Why not just simply private practice? Um, how, how, why did you make the decision or how did you make the decision to enter into dental education? So I, I can take that first. So I was, um, I always have a calling really because ever since I was a kid, I've often got put in with the worst student in the class. Uh -huh. and, and, and the teacher would say, you know, you are hopeless, go sit by some pop and have some pop tissue. <laughs> and then, I, and I ever since I was a little kid, I think like a fourth grader or something. And I always sit with someone who like the worst in the class. And my job is to make sure that the guy was paying attention and he got something out of the lectures and he do well the next exam. And then I realized that that was actually very rewarding. And actually before, when I, my high school, when in my high school, my, my, my dream job was actually want to be a chemistry professor in a small college, because I want to do a little bit of science and then teach an undergraduate student. And uh, what happened was in Thailand, we have to take an entrance exam. And, and we cannot apply directly to different school. We have to rank the school and everybody in the whole country taking the same exam at the same time, you know, the whole country and you, you rank the school. And, and what happened was I ranked uh, med, three medical school, like, like uh, engineering school, science school and business school, because, you know, I, I, I actually graduated uh, high school a year earlier because I, I took exam and I passed all the graded and then I can take the exam. So the first, so I have a next year to do it again. So I figured that, you know what, I'm just put something random and I run it by my mom. And my mom said, these two school is too far from home. I won't let you go to these two schools. I said, you know what, you just five some school that I'm matching the score because my idea was that I need to get into some school. So I'm just ranking from the highest score to the score that I think that I would get in. So she's like, these two schools I don't like. I said, just here's the booklet from last year, the score from last year, go figure it out something, you know? So my mom's like, why don't you go to dental school? Dental school is so cool. You can just, I just put one dental school in there and put another one in the other one. So then I got in dental school and I blame it all to my mom said, you know what? I don't want to be a dentist. Dentist is so boring. So why would you ever want to be a dentist? I want to go to science school and you know, you get this. And it was horrible experience, right? But anyway, so I gone to dental school and then I start liking it, right? I started liking it. I was, a, I was at first, I was gonna, in, in Thailand, we cannot transfer. So we have to take entrance exam again the following year. I said, you know what? I kind of like it. So then I end up staying. <laughs> and then when I graduate, um, the different thing is in Thailand, 80% of dentists are female. So all my professors are female, all the deans are female or the department chair are female. And we have like 20% male student, right? So then I enjoy the minority because everything would aside based on this 20 male person, right? Because you have to have, oh, gross anatomy. You're gonna have to have male in this group. This thing have male in this group. So when I graduate, I'm the only one other, there are two boys that actually graduated with honors. So every department want you to be a professor. And I was lucky enough that the pros department approached me saying, hey, you know what? We have a faculty position open. I said, you know what? I've just tried out pros for like a year. If I don't like it then. And that's, that's what happened. So I would stay in, I love teaching. And then we've gone to North Carolina, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, but I, I truly actually have a calling for teaching. And, and then I'm just accidentally become a dentist. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's an interesting perspective, though, because I think sometimes, particularly in the dental education space, right, and hopefully I don't get in trouble for saying this, but um, <laughs> in, the, in the dental education space, we're all dentists, and we're skilled at that, and we've learned that, and we can teach that, but I think sometimes there is a delineation or a distinction or maybe even a healthy tension in that now we're in this education space, and no one's really taught us necessarily, unless you've gone that path, 
to be an educator. Mm -hmm. You're, you've been taught to be a dentist. So it's really interesting that um, the way that you phrased that, that you feel that, you know, the calling part for you was the, ed the educational aspect. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Like, how did, how did you get to dental education, Dr. Chang? So I would say I can, uh, dental education, I, it was not something very uh, remarkable that, you know, I felt like dentistry is my calling. It, it didn't come like that. I just, my dad's closest friend, um, family friend uh, was a dentist. And I, as I can recall, I think um, I used to do a lot of, um, a lot of drawing, a dance, meaning I, I was so involved in these things that he used to always say, looking at my drawings and, you know, artwork that I would, if I was ever interested, I would make a very fine dentist and he would hire me, you know? So I think I always wanted to be uh, in health profession. I knew that, but I think maybe uh, that he, he had some influence in my applying towards dentistry. I definitely did very well. Uh, he was not wrong. It was, it, hand skills came very naturally to me. Um, I, you know, I didn't have that third spatial kind of any issues. It just came very naturally. Uh, regarding academics, I would say that was by accident for sure. Um, I, like I said, I was, uh, doing ortho uh, fellowship in University of Florida and was going to begin my residency um, when there was a family emergency back home here in Richmond and that uh, my ex-husband, my, uh, my, he suffered a stroke and he was a uh, faculty member here. I think I needed to share that so that people could understand, why did you come to VCU though? You know, so he was here a faculty in general practice department and the only people I knew was uh, were out here, um, and uh, I think I got tremendous support from the department here. And I uh, joined as a part-time faculty, uh, started working uh, here, and actually started loving it. Um, and I would I would say maybe uh, he was looking out. He knew that I would really find it very um, I. I didn't have any formal training for teaching, but that also came very naturally. I would say my younger brother had a role to play in it because I had to teach him a lot. He's <laughs> 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 not listening. <laughs> uh, but it, it was pretty natural uh, for, me, uh, for me to get into that role. And I really would say for um, students who are listening, um, you know, it, it's, it's, a very different world. You're not alone in academics, is what I can say. I there are pros and cons, but it, you do you do have a family. You do have an academic community, so uh, you're you don't feel alone, and you 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 can wear several hats. You are not just wearing a clinician hat. You can wear a clinician hat. You can wear a researcher hat. You can wear a teacher hat. Uh, you can wear a mentor hat, just an advisor, just one moment with one student. There are so many aspects to this academics that I feel like it brings out the, it's bring out, it's brought out the best in me is what I can say. That, that's really great because um, my, my best friend from dental school is a periodontist in DC <laughs> and he has a small office. It's just him. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, he doesn't have a partner and he often calls me to commiserate <laughs> <laughs> in that, you know, he, he's not as intellectually stimulated sometimes, uh -huh. or, you know, it's almost a little bit isolating or lonely because you don't have someone, um, not, not, you know, dentistry is hierarchical, certainly, but you don't have someone to bounce ideas off of or to kind of inspire you in those kinds of ways. Um, so certainly, um, you know, Dr. Tran really epitomizes this whole concept of grow your own faculty, which is this national thing that um, ADIA, AADR, like all of the groups, the specialty groups as well, are really trying to say and solve because we have this, they call it the graying of the faculty, no pun intended, but that our faculty, you know, are obviously aging. Um, so Dr. Tran, could you tell us a little bit more? I know you said it was just a great opportunity, but, um, and that Dr. Abu Bakr kind of offered it to you, but, but why academics for you? Yeah, so teaching kind of is built into 
the way uh, residency training is for the oral surgeon because of the nature of it. Um, how it works is when you first start off, you're an intern, you know nothing, and everyone assumes you know nothing, which is true. And so you're guided for the first couple of months by the second year resident. And then so everything you become is because of the person who taught you above you. And then as you become a second year resident, you do the same thing for the intern. And then the third year teaches the second year and then the chief resident teaches the, the third year. And so you go through four years of this practice of teaching and learning and, and understanding the best methods of teaching because you'll notice when something sticks and when something doesn't. And it's pretty rewarding and fun to watch when you have taught somebody uh, underneath you a technique or a procedure or a method or even just information. Uh, and then they are able to use that information on their own. And they kind of come up to you and they're like, hey, yeah, like remember that thing you taught me? Yeah, I just did that yesterday. It was awesome. It worked great. And so to just kind of see that happen was it's, it's a fun, fun feeling to have. It's a great feeling to have academics and why I chose to stay in academics was mainly because I don't, I think I would get bored. Uh, kind of similar to what you were saying about your friend who's a periodontist. It's also very lonely in private practice. You kind of, like you were saying, hierarchical, you don't have anybody to bounce ideas off of. So you're kind of the lone uh, provider, unless you're even, even in a group practice, you're still the lone provider because you don't really have time to talk to somebody else and to kind of bounce ideas off or just, talk like normally and not have to think that, oh, the only reason why you're talking to me is because you're my employee. It's like, you, it's actually a collegial relationship. And so in academics, what that allowed me to do was I could still have clinical practice. Um, and I can also explore these other avenues of treatments that you don't get to do as a private practice surgeon. So in private practice, you generally just take out teeth and put implants in. Uh, that's 99% or 90% of what oral surgeons do in the community. But when you come to an academic center, it's a little bit different. We, we do take out teeth, so we do still do implants, but we also do facial trauma. So we get to go to the hospital. We get to go spend a lot more time in the hospital and do these other bigger cases that don't necessarily uh, pay well, which is probably why these community uh, guys can't do very much of it. But it's, it's rewarding in itself because these are patients who don't, really don't have anywhere else to go. Um, and so they come and see us in hopes that we can help heal them or treat them. Um, and being in an academic also lets you explore these different techniques. You read something in a journal uh, and you say, you know what, let's try this. It's a new technique. Um, let's see if this is going to work. It has these benefits, has these disadvantages. And if you try to do that in private practice, you can only do techniques that you are either 90% sure is going to work or something that you learned when you were a resident. As soon as you leave, for the most part, I think a lot of practitioners, at least for our field, as soon as you graduate, that is the height of your knowledge. Um, after that, it, unless you, even with CE, it, it kind of just stagnates there. You don't really do things differently. You don't really learn new techniques because there's no one to talk to about it. There's no one to bounce ideas off of. And in academics, you can explore those new things and you can even be the one who invents these new techniques, which is the cool part about it. Um, and so because of all that, I just, I don't think I would have been as satisfied with my job or have been felt felt fulfilled um, as much as I would have as I am now in academics. Awesome, awesome, thanks for that. Um, I'm gonna pivot the conversation a little bit um, in that um, according to the American Dental Education Association or, or commonly referred to it as ADEA, about 13% of dental school faculty in the US and Canada um, identify as Asian, right? Um, and then when you look at gender, um, about 14% of all female faculty um, are Asian identifying. Um, have there been in, in you all's um, experiences, whether that is as a student, um, as a resident, um, as a faculty member, or just as a care provider, um, have there been specific challenges in your career you feel like, or barriers that you've faced because you're Asian? Um, at the same time, I'd, I think I could flip that question. Um, have there been opportunities that presented, um, particularly maybe around patient interactions um, or, or other things, I don't want to lead it too much, um, that have presented because of your ethnicity and background? Yeah, I could start with that one. Um, so as far as my career, residency, dental school, I don't, I don't think... Uh, I, at least I wasn't aware of it. I don't think my race had anything to play with that. I think that 
uh, VCU has been very welcoming um, uh, uh, to me. And I've never felt that I was being discriminated against because I was Asian. Um, so as being a faculty member here, being a student, being a resident, that was never an issue. There is, though, uh, the patience. Um, I have run into uh, racism from patients, just direct racism. Um, a couple of times uh, that come to mind is when I was a dental student, I was in, I think it was the pediatric clinic and a, uh, it was a 13 year old and we were doing a cleaning. And then the first thing that this, this patient said to me was, are you Chinese? Cause I don't trust Chinese people. And I just looked at her and I was like, what? Uh, and, and in my mind, I know that it's, it's probably not this kid's fault, right? Because mm-hmm. you don't, you aren't born with this prejudice. It, it, it comes from uh, your home where you grew up. I actually had no idea what to say. I was a student at the time and I was like, uh, no, I'm, I'm not. And um, I don't think uh, I'm not Chinese. Uh, I, I don't think you should assume that people are Chinese. And I just continued on my way because you kind of just try to diffuse the situation as much as you can. Um, Another time was when I was a resident and it wasn't as um, as uh, aggressive or overt, but I was talking about oral surgeons um, and I was just, you know, trying to make conversation, uh, starting her IV and getting ready to put her to sleep. Um, and I was explaining to her, oh, yeah, so, you know, oral surgeons, uh, we do our own anesthesia because she was asking who's going to put me to sleep. I was like, I'm going to put you to sleep and I'm going to do the surgery as well. And I think that oral surgeons are the only ones who can actually do that. And I started talking to her. I was like, actually, you know, I think American oral surgeons are probably the only people who can do that because I don't think other countries can do that. And she looked at me and said, but you're not American. Wow. And so <laughs> I just, and I had already pushed the medication. So I couldn't really educate her anymore because she was about to forget everything <laughs> I'm about to tell her. Um, but I was just thrown back. And I was like, so, like some people don't even consider you an American unless you look like them. And so I was like, I don't know anything other than being an American. Like I was born here. I grew up here. I am an American. So uh, those are a couple of times that I've run into that. And um, I haven't quite found a great way to approach it other than talking to the patient and educating them. Um, And I'm still looking for any recommendations or suggestions that even maybe you all have run into and could shed some light on. I you know that now that you're saying that i don't think i would uh, for me it was a adverse experience but uh, so many times you know um every now and then a person would say patients out here and we say you oh are you indian are you from india oh are you from uh, pakistan and i think how i've learned it every single time it works is you know i i i put a question back to them and say i, I say have you uh, it seems like you've visited there, you know, you 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 know somebody and that's what they're wanting to tell their story to you. They're wanting to say, oh, you know, I've been to India. Where are you from? That's their second question that they're trying to ask you so that they can tell you that story. That's how I have always found my conversation brings that up, that they were there in this in Delhi or what they ate or what their experience was or how they know their friend or they know someone and they're trying to make a conversation. But the way to ask is very weird. At times it can throw people off. Like, are you from India? You know, like <laughs> it can be a little bit, it can be a little bit daunting, but I think I'm, I've gotten used to it so much that I uh, maybe couch it in that way that, oh, have you been there? Do you know someone from there? And then it just leads to a conversation. Um, similar way, uh, of course, my last name is Chinese Chang, <laughs> because my <laughs> husband was and uh, uh, whenever I, I remember in New York, it was always a uh, it, never a bad experience I've had. Uh, luckily, uh, I would say I, I would go out as a resident, you're supposed to take your, you know, bring your patient out, call their name and bring them in and uh, they would look at me and I, and I know the, what the question they have. And that is like, you don't look Chinese. <laughs> I'm sure that that's where, you know, that they're trying to say. And I, I just, uh, I know what they're thinking, what they're looking at. And I just uh, break the ice by saying, you know, I know you're expecting a uh, Chinese, but my name is uh, Dr. Chang and I am from India. My husband is Chinese. And that would, you know, um, that 
what I have found is telling my story, breaking the eyes very early in the conversation helps me hear their story of where they are coming for their dental treatment of what their a gentle story is about maybe their neglect, maybe they're not having been able to pay attention to their dental work. They're able to be, feel more comfortable uh, uh, in sharing that. That helps me make a more focused treatment plan to them is what I, I can say that I've learned to do it very naturally. I think I I, now that these questions are coming up, I wish maybe I can share with maybe, I don't know, with the international students, if they face it, how they can use it as a leverage to tell, to use their story. I'm not telling everybody to, to say their stories, even if they don't want to share it, please, I don't want to, <laughs> but see what you feel comfortable with, because I would want to say 100% of the time, I don't remember a single case where it's gone wrong. And I, I think that's great because I think um, what you guys are describing are slightly different circumstances, right? But yeah. I think it, it's a good reminder, I think particularly when you're in skin that is not necessarily, um, you know, the patient doesn't look like you, right? And the patient yeah. is very accustomed to being in a place where most people look like them. Um, I think it's a good reminder that it's, it's difficult or you can get in trouble ascribing intentions to people, yeah. right? Because even though something comes out of their mouth, you don't, you don't necessarily know that intention. But I think to Dr. Tran's experience, there are some times where it's far more pointed and it feels like, okay, this, this, is, this, this is actually you know, more of a form of racism than just curiosity, right? And I think there are large hospital systems, dental schools, medical schools that are really trying to have this conversation. Actually, VCU is in the process now of joining in with UVA um, to expand this program called Stepping Up, which is where when someone sees kind of a discriminatory act, uh, you're the attending on the floor training the student, and you witness a patient say that, what do we train you to say? What do we, how do we train you to empower that student to be able to say or offer some kind of educational moment or teachable moment for themselves, right? Um, and so there's a lot of work being done about that right now. Dr. Ben Sherrod or Dr. Rothor, do you have something to share around that topic? Yeah, so it's uh, even interest. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Rothor. You haven't talked for a while. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, I was just going to. You had mentioned we could flip it and present something positive. Uh, you know, from from what you have mentioned. Um, one of the things I would say is that having a diverse pool of uh, dental providers, uh, dental educators. I think overall. Um, ultimately benefits our patients and our students both. Um, you know, I feel like you see so many health disparities right now, uh, but I can see, you know, foresee in the next 15 to 20 years, I think having uh, representation from, you know, different parts of population will help to overcome some of those health disparities. Um, you know, sometimes there are cultural nuances that you can work with, you know, being from the same uh, cultural background. So, I would say that um, diversity is welcome because overall, um, you know, in the future, hopefully it will lead to better patient outcome. Um, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, as our students are watching this, they, uh, they feel more empowered to be from different, you know, backgrounds and cultures and uh, still united in the sense that we have a common goal um, to, you know, improve the health outcomes in our country. No, I think that's really rich. Um, I challenge people all the time this, um, because I meet with diversity officers across the campus. One of my mantras I sort of have been saying is, you know, unless we really empower and educate our students to be culturally competent, they're actually not professionally competent mm -hmm. because you have to be in, in your professional expertise. I'm kind of putting on my ethics hat here, but in your professional expertise, you have to be able to interact and understand. And then furthermore, I think sometimes, particularly when there's these cultural nuances, right, or particularly around language barriers, right, um, I don't think we really achieved inform we achieve informed consent in the way that we think that we do, right? Oftentimes, a patient may sign or, or say they understand, but I think sometimes there's language um, barriers that are ethical to mention, and then these cultural nuances um, that can, you know, vary across the board that really can be an imp um, impede 
um, that full understanding. So yeah, that, that's really rich, Dr. Rathor. Dr. Ben Sher, you were gonna share. Yeah, I, I was gonna say that I have the opposite um, um, feeling with Dr. Tran because I'm always a foreigner. And I'm a foreigner everywhere. I'm in North Carolina. Nobody think that I'm from North Carolina. I'm just like, I'm from Thailand. I only lived there for 20 some years, fine. <laughs> when I came here to Virginia, like, uh, where are you from? Well, I, I, I moved from North Carolina. Really, where are you from? Like, I'm from Thailand. Oh yeah, that's great. I've been to Thailand. And now I'm just like, you know what? It's fine. I, I can be from Thailand, it's fine. Now when I go back to Thailand, guess what? I'm going back to Bangkok and try to buy stuff <laughs> and I speak perfect Thai in my mind anyway. And they're like, you're not from here. And I was like, <laughs> I was born here. I live here for 25 years. No, you, you're not from here. You don't speak like people around here. You don't even use the right word. I'm like, my Thai is perfect. It's like on TV Thai, you know, like, like no, 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 no. You're from somewhere else. Just, just tell me. I said, okay, fine. I'm from, I live in the United States. And they were like, yeah, see, you're not from here. <laughs> so, so I end up not belong anyway. But the, the weird thing about it is um, I... In North Carolina, I'm, I feel like the North Carolina population are not as diverse as Virginia, but people are so polite that you don't see discrimination face to face. They might be thinking in their head, but they don't. As soon as they move here, people are actually more diverse, but they come right in front of you discriminating. Uh, the other day, just a couple of weeks ago, I was driving and I'm just driving my Tesla, you know, my car driving very slowly. Somebody, some guy just come right next to me and open the window. I thought that he's going to ask me something, you know, like the direction or something. I open the window, the guy's just screaming at me, go back to China. I love something like that and oh give me God. a finger. Wow. And I was like, I don't even know what to say. And it just a couple of weeks ago, you know, it's not like it, 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 it and it's not random. They talk, he looked at me for a long time and he come right next to me, open the window and scream at me right here in Richmond. And I was like, this is interesting. I live in North Carolina forever and ne I never experienced this and still nobody does that, but you move up North, but is it more diverse, way more diverse here. Um, but I get more discrimination and I don't even know what to say to the person. I'm just smile and say, you know, I basically do this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a fascinating thing. I think um, some, some of the work I've been doing ar around resilience and um, even burnout and, and, and there's all these studies um, that they provide frameworks of, you know, for example, to get to patient well-being, you have to have clinician well-being, right? And that they're 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 connected on this continuum, but that all these factors influence clini clinician well-being, um, the environment you work in, the organizational culture, you know, your education, your upbringing, like all these these things, right? Stress, but societal and cultural norms is actually one of these things on this framework too that influences clinician well-being, and so you know, with what you just shared, like you just driving and someone, you know, yelling that at you, how, how do you go, say if that's an experience that you're experiencing at 7.30 in the morning and you have a patient at eight, how, how, how do you make that transition or, or does it affect um, your state, you know, there, I think, you know, from an African-American context, I think, you know, not, not to get into way deep political aspects of things, but like, I've always been someone who's like, they continue to show even the news coverage of like all these shootings and all these killings. And it's like traumatic to even watch. And like, you don't even have to click on it. Like it just starts playing like on accident, right? That's like, how do you then transition to work, right? When, when you watch those things or you experience these things like what you're saying or what Dr. Tran said, you know, from a, from a patient to say, well, you're not American. And then like, I, but I still want you to provide a service for me. <laughs> I still want you to help me, even though I've insulted you, right? Um, is there a connection there for you? Or how, how do you kind of turn that, that corner, you think? You know, I, 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 for that, because it goes by so fast, I couldn't address anything for him. But in my mind, at first, I was get angry a little bit. Like, what the hell is this? I didn't even do anything. And then for, 
for a few minutes later while I'm driving, I don't remember, I drive, oh, I'm driving back to North Carolina actually. And then I have a long drive to, to kind of contemplate about it. And I actually feel sorry for the person. And, and, and I feel sorry that, you know, why would the person get so angry enough that he have to come open the window and say the word and give me a finger, even though I didn't do anything to him. You know, I don't even really know the person, you know, it'd be different if I did something or, you know, do something stupid or something. Obviously I haven't done anything and, and I don't even know how to, how to address that. But we have an incident in my CAD CAM clinic when I was supervised CAD CAM clinic and everybody know April, uh, April was a was an assistant there at the time. And I was supervising student and this, the patient call April using an N word. Wow. And what I did, and I heard it, everybody heard it, right? And I was just like, I'm just saying, April, you need to file a report. You, 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 you don't have to be in the clinic right now. You need to take care of yourself. We're going to file a report. This patient will not, we will finish this procedure for the day. This patient will not come back to my clinic. And we end up dismiss the patient. Somebody com complete the treatment. And we, we, of course, we obligate to complete the care that day. Mm. For, 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 for that time, but the whole, after that, the, the patient denied that he ever said it, even though everybody heard it. You know, so we write a report and we, and I have to take care of, of my staff because she should not have to experience that. And, and I, I have to take, on the other hand, I have to take care of the patient because we start the procedure, we have to finish it. But we want to make sure that that kind of behavior cannot be tolerated in the environment that we have here at BCU and the patient were dismissed and he cannot even come back to the building. Well, I, I think, you know, I, I hate that that experience happened, but I think it's such a teachable moment, the stand that you took. Um, at, you know, I teach ethics and professionalism to our second year students and I have lots of scenarios that they go through and role play and, and one of, you know, whether it's sexual harassment, all these kinds of things. And we talk about how particularly in private practice, but anytime, the dentist is the leader of a team, whether you want to accept that role or not. And you have a responsibility uh, to many parties, but one of those is your staff. So they, they are not in a hostile environment, that they're not in a toxic environment, that they feel psychologically and physically safe. Um, so I, I think that's important that, you know, when we see these kinds of things occur, that we don't turn a blind eye. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important because I think, again, to your experience, Dr. Ben Sherrod, you know, likely these incidences are out of ignorance, a lack of education, fear. Um, you know, you know, that is very real and tangible. I think that's the other thing. Sometimes we have to realize in that person's world or head, mm -hmm. it's it's very real to them. You know, it's 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 you know, although we may not agree, that is their context and, and their kind of version of reality. Um, but we can still educate them and equip them um, if they allow us to. And if they don't, then certainly there are decisions that have to be made. But yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a tough one. Um, but it is the world in which we live, right? The reality in which we live, which is why talking about these issues, educating folks on these issues is really um, not some separate entity from dental education, right? This is a part of who we are as healthcare providers, particularly when you talk about disparities in care, um, that COVID really laid bare among lots of populations. I can't turn on the news now without seeing how India is being ravished with, with COVID right now, or you know the, the um, uptick in anti-Asian kind of criminality that's happened even in the States. Um, that's not separate from who we are as, as dental providers, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you guys um, for sharing your insight with us on that. Um, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Is there anything anyone just wants to share? I, I know we didn't get to all the questions I had, but um, anything anyone wants to share about your experiences or things we've talked about, or um, maybe perhaps we'll end on, where do you see dental education going? Do you think it's more inclusive um, than when you were a resident or a trainee? And, and, and wh where do you see the promise you see in dental education today? So, um, Carlos, I would like to talk, you know, we want 
to, I feel like we should always end stuff with positive uh, things, you know, especially if our students are watching, uh, you know, leave them with a positive frame of mind. Um, so I think talking about inclusiveness, um, I can see um, that we really at BCU are really trying really hard uh, to be inclusive. Um, I can speak from my personal experience. I have been here 11 years in the department. Uh, my department is oral diagnostic sciences, as most of you know. And in my department, I think we are diverse um, in both representing different specialties within the department, folks who are uh, at different level of their career. And, um, you know, we really, I think everyone, I can speak for each and every one of us, we really make it a point to be inclusive. Um, you know, people, uh, we do like outings, um, regular outings. Uh, of course, this was pre-COVID. Um, people are really excited to try different cuisines. I know I bring Indian food all the time and people, uh, you know, literally will fight over uh, trying, wanting to try the food. Um, just a couple of days back, you know, we had a, a take food we took out from an Indian place and everybody loves to try that. So um, people are really open, inclusive, um, and that really makes for a great working atmosphere. So I think I can say uh, pretty safely that, you know, from when we were back in dental school to our work lives now, and then for our next generation, you know, the next 15, 20 years, um, the atmosphere is changing. Uh, I think people are accepting um, of, you know, the differences. Uh, they want to know about your cultural, um, you know, what, what is your culture, you know, what is your story? Um, and they're more open and understanding of it. And um, they're excited to be inclusive. So, um, I mean, I, I, I really believe it when I say that I think our, um, hopefully in the next, you know, 15, 20 years, um, we will be having very different conversations. Uh, and they will be not on these topics. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's positive and reinforcing to see that. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I think that I, I, I have a positive note that our faculties are, are even uh, getting more diverse every, every, every day, not just the student body. And I'm just gonna the, to comment something about Dr. Dan Tran, for example. So the oral surgery department hasn't had anybody that they trained themselves to be a faculty. You know, anybody in your department that were trained here? Nobody. So Dan is actually the first, I would say the first homegrown generation oral surgery faculty here at BCU. And there's something to be proud of as an Asian American, right? You're the first one. Mm -hmm. And usually for, for, for the Asian anyway, uh, being a teacher is hold really highly as, as, a, as a top of the profession. And I want to congratulate him. And I think that, I think that he's a part of new generation and we need to cherish this uh, diversity generation and homegrown faculty. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Minshir. Anyone else with, I don't want to put pressure on you, but last words at all you'd like to share? If not, yeah. okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Minshir, for those kind words. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I think it's important to remember that diversity and inclusion, um, it has to be deliberate. It's not something that just happens automatically. It has to be something that you have to consciously think about. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's just something to always be aware of and you have to work at it. It's not mm -hmm. always automatic or ingrained or you don't grow with it. Just like how you don't, uh, you don't become prejudiced. You also don't become inclusive automatically it's you have it's not something that just happens automatically and i think uh it's it's a uh, i just wanted to remind everyone like hey like we are diverse uh we are all inclusive and, it, and it's because we all work to be diverse and work to be inclusive and it, it's not something that you can just if you forget about it or just hope that it's going to be better it's not going to work everyone has to work together to make vcu better to make it more diverse make it more inclusive and and, and just kind of get together like one whole big vcu family Thank you. And it's, and, you know, it's a role, it's a, everyone has a part in it, right? It's not, um, even though we have, you know, a, 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 an associate dean of student affairs, right? Everyone engages in student affair activity because we all touch students every day, right? So it's the same with diversity, equity, inclusion. It has to be on the mindset of everyone. And, and, and but that also means when we're deliberate about it, that sometimes we may make, make mistakes, you know, especially as we, grow in our, our knowledge of cultural competency, right? Which I think is a, a continuum anyway. I don't think we reach some 
finite point where now, oh, now you earn this badge of cultural competence, right? Because culture is always evolving and growing. Um, but we may make mistakes. We make, make, may make a misstep. Um, and so I tease people with that all the time. You know, if, if you've never broken an endo file, it means you haven't done enough endo, right? Or, or whatever, you know, it would be for your, your area of expertise. So, I, so thank you for that, Dan, and reminding us that it, it is a deliberate and intentional um, core value and pathway um, to uphold, right? Um, Dr. Chang, anything? No, I think I was actually going something similar is what I was going to say what Dan said and rightfully he's I'll echo what he said it's it's a very deliberate we need to consciously work actively work on it and uh, it's not something I, I think I think we'll we'll have to continuously always work at it it's not yeah. something it's a finite moment we will reach like you said you know tomorrow or it's something that we all need to just continue to work. Well, I, I thank you guys so much for participating. I really enjoyed learning more about your journeys and your stories and your backgrounds. Um, thanks to everyone, the, the folks watching, and um, this will also be available via video so people will watch it later that really got to learn all about your journeys and narratives and help us celebrate um, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month here at VCU School of Dentistry. Thanks for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.